Good evening. I'm glad you can take some time to devote to worship this weekend. And uh, the announcements we have for this weekend are uh, that we do have our Thanksgiving meal coming up here on Thanksgiving. We anticipate being able to do a dine-in. If something goes uh, crazy, we'll do, go to carry-out. But um, we will have dine-in, and that's our plan right now. Uh, I don't think there's anything else we need to announce. It still feels like we're in the, kind of the, the brief lull before the, the storm of the, the holidays, which are impending. So, uh, if we were to go on a journey together, on foot, as a community, you, me, your family, our families, and we're going to take a journey, what would we need to work out? We would obviously need to work out uh, shelter, what would we sleep in, food, you only carry so much food, how do we replenish our food supply as we go, how to cook that food, uh, etc. Um, what if this journey was going to take not just hours or days, but what if this journey was going to take years, decades, a generation? There become other things that need to be worked out in such situations. Things that aren't quite as obvious at, at the get-go, but things that over time just you, you got to work out. Uh, like... How would we handle decision-making? How do we handle disagreements? Because anytime you have people in the same room, or, well, not, not the same room, in this case, in the same tent. Anytime you have people in the same journey, the same tent for long enough, eventually you have disagreements. Who, who arbitrates, who decides, who handles those disagreements? As Moses leads a group of former slaves out into the wilderness, for a time period that will be not just months or years, but an entire generation, this is one of the questions he has to answer. And it's his father-in-law, Jethro, that tells him, Moses, you got to find a better way. He pulls him aside and says, son, you got to you got to work this out better. you got to divide people. Because the, the, as Moses leads the people into the wilderness, they, they just bring all their problems to him, which is fine, but got to be very overwhelming very quickly. And so his father-in-law tells him, like, you got to work out a better way. Why don't you divide people into groups of uh, groups of hundreds and tens, and you, know, you put people you trust over in these groups and let them handle the, the easy stuff. So the, you get the humdingers, the hard ones, but for the most part, people can kind of just go to those smaller group leaders. That works. And that's how uh, the, the Hebrew people... Uh, govern themselves for decades until they get to the promised land. And, and so uh, they take 40 years, they go to Mount Sinai, they receive the Ten Commandments, they receive further teaching uh, Torah as they travel. This story unfolds over the second half of the book of Exodus. As uh, then it unfolds, they go through Leviticus, how the story, they learn how to worship together, what the, what the sacrifice is going to mean. Then they, we have the book of Numbers that uh, goes through some more of the stories uh, of that time in between Mount Sinai and the 40 years before they get to the Promised Land. And then uh, we get to the book of Deuteronomy where they are on the edge of the Promised Land. They're going to enter into the Promised Land next. That's the next step for them. You get done with the book of Deuteronomy and the next page they're going into the Promised Land. <clears throat> and um, they have to figure out what's going to change. Like, and so Deuteronomy is the book that starts to tell them what's going to change. They're going to go from worshiping in a tabernacle, which is a very big tent, to worshiping in a temple, where they're going to take the stuff that was in the tabernacle, they'll put it in the temple, but that, that's going to change the experience uh, of worship. And um, another thing that's going to change is that leadership structure. Like, Moses is going to die. What's going to be next? How will they handle power and decision-making in the promised land? How, what's that going to look like? And so uh, Deuteronomy starts laying out the, these answers, these questions. What will it look like to live as God's people, not as nomads who are always traveling, but now we're going to live as farmers? That's going to be different. What is that going to look like? <clears throat> and so Deuteronomy are the, the, the five speeches of Moses that go over this. Uh, Deutero means second, and nomos is the word for law. So it is the second 
giving of the law. It's the second sort of working through of the law. This is how you will live according to the law, according to the teaching of God, uh, in as people who are settled in the promised land. And so this part of Deuteronomy gives the answer to this question. How will decision making be handled? Deuteronomy 17. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you have taken possession of it, and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a, over you a king whom the Lord your God will choose. I mean, right there, detail, the Lord your God will choose. One of your own community you may set as a king over you. You are not permitted to put a foreigner over you who is not of your own community. Even so, he must not acquire many horses for himself or return the people to Egypt in order to acquire more horses, since the Lord has said, you must never return that way again. And he must not acquire many wives for himself, or else his heart will turn away. Also silver and gold he must not acquire in great, great quantity for himself. When he has taken the throne of the kingdom, he shall have a copy of this law, like Deuteronomy, written for him, in the presence of the priest, it shall remain with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, diligently observing all the words of this law and these statutes, neither exalting himself above other members of the community, nor turning aside from the commandment, either to the right or to the left, so that he and his descendants may reign long over his kingdom in Israel. This is a pretty impressively well fleshed out understanding of how uh, a king is going to function. Right? You listen to what that requires. Uh, the king is going to be bound to follow and to study and to teach the, the God's law. Like that, that's an impressive standard that's being set here. <clears throat> and and this, this king is not going to be given free reign to do as he pleases. We read it's further in Deuteronomy 18, the next chapter on, we read, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet, like me, Moses, like me, from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. Right? So you'll have a king who will be entrusted with, uh, will have a his own personal copy of the Bible. Right? And that's a pretty big deal to have a copy, because copies are uh, all created by hand at that point. And that king is going to have a prophet on hand to point out when he has fallen short in paying attention to and leading and teaching and studying that that word of God. And, and that's that's a dramatic shift um, from having Moses to having a king and a prophet. And it's not that it won't work. It will work. But they, they've changed gears. Like what got them from A to B from slavery to the edge of the promised land, what well, got them from A to B will not get them from B to C. Now they've got to go from into the promised land and they've got to settle it and they've got to live in a different fashion. And so they have to do something different. They're going to switch gears and now they're going to go from having a sort of Moses as the, the leader, a, a sole power authority type of person with the assistance of his brother Aaron to now we have king and prophet. Now this does not mean that they just ditch everything that came before. Like, it's a striking thing that they didn't, like, the Jewish people didn't, like, take Deuteronomy and say, ah, we got it right this time. And, like, pff, like shove off Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. We don't need you. We got Deuteronomy. We got it right. right? They don't ditch what came before. They hold on to it, and it becomes essential, and it is essential, because it shows where you start, right? It shows the beginning of the process. Here is where, this is how God started teaching God's people back in the, when they first got out of slavery. You start with the Ten Commandments, and, you, and then what, you, you can start looking at, like, what are the first things that God wants to deal with? Ten Commandments. And then what comes, that's Exodus 20. Exodus 20, Exodus is about 40 chapters. The first half is getting them out of slavery. Exodus 20 is at Mount Sinai. They get the Ten Commandments. First thing, Ten Commandments. What do we need to talk about next after the Ten Commandments? We need to start talking about protecting the lives of people, Exodus 21. And then at the end of Exodus 21, it mentions like, and if you have an ox that kills people, you got to deal with that. 
And then it gets into, now if the ox kills other livestock, that's less important. And you start seeing the priorities shake out. Like, what do we need to talk about first? Life. And what's more, and, and property, is property as important in life, as life? No. The ox that kills a person is something you have to deal with before you deal with the ox that hurts another ox. I, it just, you, you gotta, the Jews decided we were going to hold on to this. Because this shows the line of thought, how you start shaping, how God started shaping and teaching people. <clears throat> and, and then when the situation changes, they go from being nomads living in the wilderness to being farmers settled down. Uh, th that's when Deuteronomy comes along. Deuteronomy is going to teach them how to live as farmers, sedentary, uh, settled farmers. Uh, they Now they have two points. Like you have the point of reference of here is how we live as uh, nomads. Here's what it looks like to live as nomads. And, and then we have a second point of reference. Here is how we live as sedentary farmers. And, and if you have one point, like that's good. That's useful. Like here's how do you live as nomads trying to be faithful to God. But like that's only useful for if you're nomads. If you have two points, right, then you have a line. It's geometry, right? That's it. If you have two points, now you have a line. Now you, this is what matters. Like as you go from point A to point B, you can sort of project out. This is what, this is what is the constant between where they began as nomads and here's where they're going as farmers. Like here is what you hold on to. Here's what matters. Here's the line of thought that becomes clear as you look at how the law develops right it's you don't stop having leadership you have leadership when you're a nomad you have the moses and, and his brother aaron and, and his sister miriam and, and like very important to hold on to those folks and this is how they lead and then you have kings when you settle down as, in, in the in the as farmers in, in the promised land and it's not that we try to recreate having moses but that you look at what what was essential about how moses led and then what change when they had kings and what did they hold on to and what did they leave behind what was the the constant there the constant was that the leader moses and then the kings are under the authority of god they are under the authority of god they do not get to make it up as they go they are accountable moses is account moses messes up and he's told by God, you're not going in the promised land. He is accountable to God. And then the kings, they are accountable to God. They are going to have the priests there who are going to keep on reminding him, you read in your Bible, you got to read your Bible. You are responsible for reading and teaching your Bible. And we got a prophet over here to make sure you're doing what the Bible says, right? And so that sense of humility and accountability is, is that's the line between the leadership of when they were nomads and, and then the line that, that that's the constant that that's the line of thought for when they they are settled down the the form of leadership changes to go from moses being in charge to having kings that that's a different type of leadership but the, what stays the same is humility and accountability to god and so that that is what that's why they hold on to it right the line of thought is there and so what the bible says with regard to how we le live with um again continuing to use our example of leadership is that how you live depends on the situation you're in as the situation you're in changes how you live is going to change but you follow that line of thought and you say ah but our leadership needs to continue to be humble and accountable to god okay how do we have leadership in this context that is humble and accountable to god and, and so that that's that to me is just very helpful and very useful because the, like the Jewish tradition, the Jewish law is that you figure it out based upon this line of thought that you follow in the Bible. And you say, how do I follow this line of thought so that it connects then to how we live today? And, and this is a, a challenge for us because we start, this is talking about how Jewish law works and Jewish law as you figure it out, right? It, 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 based upon this line of thought. And American law is like the antithesis of that. American law, we start talking about American law. Oh man, American law. <laughs> American law, if you go back to uh, the philosophy of the enlightenment, the way of thinking that formed the founding fathers, uh, that approach to law, to law was developed, in, in my understanding, if I'm incorrect, please, 
please let me know. I, I have much to learn in this area. But my understanding of the law was the law was developed so that um, all you had needed to do, if you, if you didn't know what to do, you just needed to consult the law. Like, there's this idea that the law would be accessible. Everyone could just read the law and understand the law. And that if you didn't, weren't sure what you should be doing in any situation, you would just go read the law and the law would tell you. And so if there was a situation that was not covered by the law, well, the legislature would just write more law and then we could read it and we would know what to do. And American law, well, I don't think it's accessible. And I don't think it covers every situation. I, I think American law kind of, if, if it, according to my understanding of the original goals of American law, I think we are 0 for 2 in being either accessible. We are neither accessible nor uh, is American law sort of uh, detailed enough, or I don't think any law is capable of being detailed enough to cover every situation. In any attempt to do so, like... How often do you run across those lists on Facebook or those like you can't believe what's illegal in this small town in Nebraska or whatever. You still can't you can't have root beer floats while having a butterfly net or something like there's always some random uh, law that's that's floating around out there because someone tried to write the law that would cover every situation. And so like the American understanding of law is just not it's not what we see here when we see we talk about. Um, when most, we talk about law in, in, in the Bible, we're just talking about it's not trying to cover everything. It's trying to establish the line of thought that it, you follow it as it changes over time. You follow it as it develops and it helps you learn this is the way we think through. This is what matters. This is what's important. So, again, the leadership example, humility and accountability. That's what matters. Right? To give another example of this, <clears throat> what we read in the Bible, like the beginning of the giving of the law is the Ten Commandments. Like that is where you begin. And so the Exodus 1 through 20 or 1 through 19 gets the, the Hebrew people out of slavery and gets them to Mount Sinai. And at, at Mount Sinai, they are given the Ten Commandments. And then if Deuteronomy, like Deutero, second giving of the law, where do you start with the second giving of the law? Like, okay, Moses gets up there and he's going to give the law. In the first speech of the five speeches, he tells the story of Exodus 1 through 19. Or he tells how they got to Mount Sinai. So there, he's going to get to the Ten Commandments, but it turns out to be really important to understand. It's, you, you just can't just say, here's the Ten Commandments. you got to understand who it is that gave the Ten Commandments. And how do you understand who it is that gave the Ten Commandments? Well, you need to understand the story of how that loving God got involved to free God's, God's people, right? And so, so that's part of, like, you shall have no other God before me. It doesn't make any sense if you don't know who that God is and what that God cares about, right? So the first speech of Moses starts with, um, his. this is a story of us as a people. Can't forget that. And then he gets into... Uh, gets into uh, the actual commandments, right? So I want to I want to point out another example of this line of thought, the, the way this works. In the first way time the Ten Commandments are shared in Exodus twenty, Hebrew people have gotten out of slavery. They've marched to Mount Sinai. They're, Moses goes up the mountain. He comes down the mountain. He tells them. The Ten Commandments, he gets to the end of the Ten Commandments, and the last two commandments are, Exodus 20, the Ninth Commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. And then the Tenth Commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female slave, ox, donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Okay. Now listen again to the way these last two commandments are shared when Moses gives them in Deuteronomy. This is 40 years later. Like 40 years later, this is how Moses tells the Ten Commandments. The last two commandments are, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And then the Tenth Commandment, neither shall you covet your neighbor's house, field, male or female slave, ox, donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. There's a change there, isn't there? In Exodus 20, 
the ninth commandment is don't covet your neighbor's house. And then the tenth commandment is don't covet your neighbor's wife. And then the wife is put in the same commandment as the do your donkey, right? So nine, don't covet your neighbor's house. And ten, don't covet your neighbor's wife or donkey or anything else, right? And so the wife is put on the same level as your neighbor's donkey. And at some point between Mount Sinai and getting to the banks of the River Jordan and they're ready to enter the Promised Land, they realize something. We need to tell those commandments a little bit differently. So that when Moses gets up there and says the Ninth Commandment, he says the Ninth Commandment, this is Deuteronomy 5, is you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And then the Tenth Commandment is you shall not covet your neighbor's ox or donkey or anything else or house, right? And, and so uh, the wife gets a promotion. The wife between Sinai and the banks of the River Jordan, the wife is promoted from being on the same level as an ox to being, oh, they should get their own commandment. Now, if you think about the situation they'd come out of, they had been slaves. They had been treated uh, where everyone was effectively livestock. All the Egyptians looked down upon them as human ox, human donkeys, right? And so for the Hebrew men to then refer to their wives in this manner, that's what they'd seen the Egyptians do, right? So it rubbed off. And now, after a generation of having part... I mean, and then they're living in the wilderness together. Like, that, that's a partnership, right? You, you're living in the wilderness with someone... And there's no one else to tell you how to do it. You just, you develop a partnership with your, your spouse, husband or wife. And that changed how they understood uh, what they had heard in the Ten Commandments. And so they told the Ten Commandments differently. Which, which set of commandments is right? They're both the Ten Commandments, right? I would argue this, again, shows that line of thought, right? They... The way they told the Ten Commandments changed because they grew more, they learned more, they understood more that wives are more important than, than donkeys. A very good thing to realize, right? And, and there will be further realizations that come down the road because the, the line of thought continues until you get to the point where uh, Paul, who, who at first wants to tell women that uh, women shall be silent in church, by the end of his ministry is... Uh, praising Junia as one of the great apostles, the highest position in the church. Like the line of thought continues, but this is where it begins, right? The, there is a, a real patriarchy that's built into the Bible, but it starts being undermined and broken down right here as you go from the first time the Ten Commandments are given, where the wives equal ox, to the second giving, where wives are promoted. And they're, they're not to be coveted, but they get their own commandment this time, right? This way of reading the Bible takes more. It takes more time. It takes uh, time to understand the whole story. It takes time to get all of the Bible into your head and sort of get the arc of, of, of what is happening. It, it takes more uh, effort and thought to work through. Like it, it takes thinking through like where am I in Scripture and where have I been and where am I going and, and how does this make sense like reading paul and reading where paul early paul is according to their versus later paul like how does paul develop you start reading like matthew uh, uh, mark is the first gospel that's written and then matthew and luke and then john is the last and like how does the way that people talk about jesus change over time it's not that jesus changed but how people talked about Jesus changed so that by the time you get to John, they're talking about Jesus in a different way that reflects a deeper understanding of who Jesus is. Right? This is a way of reading scripture that, that's looking for the line of thought that is, it demands more of us, but I think it gives us a far richer, deeper, more meaningful, more truthful way to get out, to, to live this, right? Because the question is not, how do I take this, this story of Moses in the wilderness and, and how do I go back and live as a nomad? 
who's trying to follow God. This, the question is, how do I look at the way that Moses learned to tell the Ten Commandments better and following that line of thought to how Paul learned how to treat women better to then understand how I'm supposed to live today in an entirely different context, but following that same line, trusting and believing that as we do this, we're following this line that leads us in the end towards the kingdom of God. It can be uh, a bit overwhelming. It can be a bit challenging. It can be somewhat scary. Like, what, what, what am I grappling with here? I, I can just imagine, like, the first time that Moses got up there and said, you know what, I think we need to change how we say this ninth commandment. Like, whoo, that would have been, that would have been a moment, I'm sure. But I think it is a way to, this way of reading scripture helps us understand a line of thought that helps us grapple with how do we understand what is true, what is important, what is essential, without getting bogged down in uh, what is contextual, what is a former context, a, a, an older way of living that we don't live today, because I, I don't want to be a nomad in the 12th century BC. I'm, I'm pretty content being who I am in, in this time and place. I want to end by wrapping up and pointing out something about how the, how this ends, Deuteronomy ends. Like, so Deuteronomy ends what are known as the five books of Moses. So it's the five books of Moses starts with Genesis, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Genesis. In the beginning of Genesis, we have this story of humanity, Adam and Eve, and, and they're leaving what they've known, the garden. And they're stepping out of the garden, and they're going to go off into this land that they've not explored. And all they know is that God will be with them, and now they've got to figure out a new way to live. And it happens again. Here we are at the end of Deuteronomy. And, and what's happened is we have the God's chosen people, this chunk of humanity, and they're standing on the banks of the River Jordan, and they're going to go off into this land that God has provided for them, and they believe that this is going to be a gift, and they but they don't know exactly how they're going to live into it yet. I think that's true of the church, of us following Jesus at every stage. Like we're standing on the press, uh, uh, on the, we're standing in today, looking towards tomorrow, and we don't know what it will bring, but we know that God is already there, and we'll figure it out as we go, believing that this this line of thought, this way of thinking that we are inheriting, will be our guide, and, and that that's enough. And I'm very deeply thankful for it. Amen.